Good afternoon to you, Nanda Pobin, and welcome back to the Royal Borough of Carnarvon, with only just over two hours to go now to the investiture of the Prince of Wales. A ceremony first foreshadowed by the Queen when she created her eldest son, Prince of Wales, 11 years ago, and which has been in preparation ever since. A rare and notable occasion for Britain and the Commonwealth, and shared today through television with much of the rest of the world. This afternoon's events on BBC television will be seen by nine countries in Europe, Canada, the United States, Argentina, Australia, New Zealand and Japan. But above all, of course, it's a great occasion for Wales. Or, oh, to, put, to put it in Welsh, Diurnad Māori have you, Diurnad Māori Wlad Vechan. A big day for a little country. Golwg yn ôl i'r gorffennol a golwg ymlaen i'r dyfodol. A look to the past and a look to the future. This little town of Carnarvon, great in history, lies just to the west of the great mountain barrier of Snowdonia. Mountains which look green and welcoming enough today. But in winter, these mountains can still be impassable when snow and mist descend on the mountain roads. The mountain Snowdon itself has in the Welsh language a name even more fitting. The Welsh for the kingly bird, the eagle, is Erir. And our word for Snowdon is Errari, the high place of eagles. Our mountain soars up at the centre of the ancient kingdom of Gwynedd, cradle of song and saga, an obstinate territory which was entered by the invader, absorbed even, conquered, Never. But invaders from the east did settle on Carnarvon's coastal plain. The Romans borrowed the Celtic name of Carnarvon's river Seont for their fortress of Sigontium. This they occupied for 300 years, till their empire decayed and fell, and they returned home. But, but in this obstinate kingdom, one seed had sprouted, flourished, and was to go on flourishing. The seed of Christianity. As early as the 5th century, St. Peblig, St. Peblig, dwelt in his monastic cell on the site of Carnarvon's parish church, to be built only 800 years after him in the 13th century. Then came the Normans. England fell to them, and although the Welsh resisted for almost 200 years, at last they were forced to yield. In 1282, Llewellyn ap Griffith, the last Welsh Prince of Wales, was killed. A year later, King Edward I started to build this fortress and others like it, designed to keep the Welsh in subjection. Here the king's son was born, and in 1301, the king gave him the lands of the Principality of Wales, and after a lapse of some years, revived the title that went with them, creating him Prince of Wales. That is why Castell Carnarvon, Carnarvon Castle, and with it the expression Prince of Wales, that is why the two became for us Welsh for hundreds of years, objects of healthy hate. Symbols of a foreign yoke. To Welsh eyes and ears, the whole region was infested with strangers, a jabber of incomprehensible tongues. And for many grim years, no Welshman walking in his own countryside was allowed to set foot within his own town walls. It was on this spot, Queen Enola's gate, that nearly 700 years ago, King Edward I may have held up his infant son uh, to tell the Welsh that they had a new prince. And it was from the same gate in 1911 that Prince Edward, now the Duke of Windsor, was presented immediately after his investiture, the first to be held in Carnarvon. David Lloyd George, a local boy from the village of Llanastimdwy, became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And during World War I, it was he who, at the blackest moments, set the British imagination on fire with oratory inspired by the Welsh Pregethwyr, the preachers of his childhood. It was he, too, whose dream it had been in 1911 to see the then heir to the British throne invested not in London, but in Carnarvon, so restoring its true meaning to the title Prince of Wales. 
And yet the same Lloyd George, only 10 years earlier, had declared himself a nationalist. Now we shall get our first glimpse of the Prince of Wales today soon after two o'clock when the Royal Train is due to pull in at Griffith's Crossing, about two miles northeast of Carnarvon, on the road to Bangor, and then uh, the Prince will drive in along roads already lined with troops and spectators, drive in an open carriage with the Prince of Wales escort of the Household Cavalry, and he'll drive down to the castle here where the ceremony will take place. And for that welcome, there can be no more fitting, no more dramatic setting in the whole of Wales than this royal town of Carnarvon. It was here that the first Prince of Wales was born 700 years ago. It was here that Edward, the eldest son of George V, was invested as prince and presented to his people in 1911. And it's to this same castle, to that gate, that the Queen will come today to honour the promise that she made to the Welsh people 11 years ago at the Commonwealth Games at Cardiff, that one day she too would present to the them, the people at Carnarvon, her eldest son, as their prince, the Prince of Wales. Whatever happens inside the castle today, it will be that presentation of the Prince of Wales to his people, by his mother, that will mark the climax of the ceremony for the thousands of people already crammed in Carnarvon Square. This little town in the northwest corner of Wales is bursting at the seams today. It's nine and a half thousand inhabitants and lost in a sea of some quarter of a million visitors. They're still pouring in from every corner of the world. All the roads are closed except for official cars. The railway line that stretches 240 miles to London has already been bringing the special trains from the south of Wales and from England. And at two o'clock, at another station, the royal train will arrive. An hour later, the ceremony inside the castle will begin. And then, at about half past three, the people of Carnarvon will meet their new prince for the first time. Some of them would have been here some 58 years ago to watch his great uncle go through the same or a similar ceremony. For them, the castle today is hardly recognizable as the scene of 1911. Inside, as you will hear from Richard Baker, the changes are even greater. Well, good morning to you, Borodar, from inside the castle, where the present day is for 1969 bears absolutely no relation to the one used in 1911. Then it was a kind of oblong canvas tent designed, it almost seems, to exclude the possibility that anyone could see what was going on inside. This dais now is a very elegant, simple structure, and above all, it's a very open one, with that great perspex cover over it, which allows everybody in the castle a good view, and also, of course, the millions of people who'll be watching all over the world on television, because this is a ceremony very much designed for television. If we look now at the walls of the castle, we will see that the ancient stones of the castle have been largely allowed to speak for themselves. There are just the banners up there on the walls of the red dragons and the coats of arms of members of the royal family and the ancient Welsh princes of Wales, but otherwise the walls are left simple, a perfect background for the pageantry to follow. Now, some people in the lower ward of the castle won't, in fact, have a very direct view of the dais, and so Lord Snowden has made sure that they'll be able to see something by installing convex mirrors on the wall just near the Eagle Tower. It may slightly distort the leading characters in his own words, but anyway, they'll be able to see something of what's going on, and they'll be better off, say, than people in Westminster Abbey. Now, there are already quite a lot of people around in the castle, as you can see. There are heralds, there are uh, ushers waiting to show people to their places in the castle. In fact, everything seems to be set now for the beginning of today's great ceremony in the castle here. And down below that statue of Lloyd George, We've got the man for whom this is really a very great day. The mayor of Carnarvon, the mayor of the only royal town in Wales, I believe. Only royal borough in Wales. Only royal borough in Wales it is, I be. How old were you before you learned to speak English? Eight. Eight. (laughs) And now you are on this great day wearing your chain of office there, which is... uh, Now, I think we really ought to take a look at that little medallion because that's got a story to it. This came from, this was threads from the bottom of the Thames, this. It was, pro, it's a Celtic shield. We were probably princes and kings on the Thames at that time when the English were swineherds on the Danube, so this is a very valuable piece of gold, this is. But on the back, it's got this written, Cadwallader Brenin Olaf Cymru. Can we drop it down a bit? There we are, that's better, now we can see it. Cadwallader 
the last King of Wales, and at last it's come home because my wife is a Cadwallader. So it's, so come, it's come all the way back. Last, but one yes. other thing we've got here to show you is that uh, on the chain of office, there are in fact 20, they have been until today, 20 links. 20 links, and this is the 21st. Every new investiture, a new link is put in. And we've got this new one here, Charles, Philip, Arthur, George. The other 20 links, mind you, I would be very much happier if they had the names of the old Princes of Wales on this, because it's now, after 550 years in Zoing Glyndwr, that we're getting a prince who can speak to us in our own language. Yeah, they've got some here, the Edward of Westminster, Henry of Monmouth, uh, Richard of Bordeaux. I bet he couldn't speak Welsh well, at any rate. Not a word. Uh, there, there have been, there have been uh, of course, a number of people who, who are not really in favour of the investiture. How do the people of Carnarvon react to this? We haven't seen anybody. Well, I've asked people like yourself who've come here. Can you find any hysterical imperialist here? Can you find anybody who is hysterically against? And they can't find either. This is an old, dignified, sensible and royal town. We're used to this, 2,000 years of it. We've seen the princes and the kings coming. And all we want, you've got 10 million people in London to provide a coronation. We had 9,500 to provide an investiture. And at the end of the day, we'll have done it as well here as they did it over there. Mayor, thank you very much indeed. I'll let you get on with your official duties now. I'm going to have a quick word with some children who are over here. We've gathered them together because eventually the whole thing is going to be a mass of children. Now, the mayor's just said that he says I can't find anyone against the investiture. Is there any one of you who's against it? You are. Now, tell me, let me come in there and tell me why. Because he's English. The prince is English. Why are you, what are you doing here today, then, if you're against the investiture? Oh, it's a thing you can never see again, all these soldiers and and the prince being presented to us, or we never see it again in our lives. Let, let me see if any of the others, I'll come back to you in a minute, any of the others of you are against it? No, you're all, you're all for it. What are you looking forward to most today? Sorry. Oh, the procession, I think. The procession. Yes. Have you ever seen the, the Prince of Wales? No, never. This is your first glimpse of him yes. today. Have either of you ever seen any of the royal family or, no. up, up here at all? No, no. So this too is your first glimpse of them? Yes. Well, I think what we can do is I know that you speak Welsh. How many of you speak Welsh? Nearly all of you. Oh, I say, well, I've got one here who speaks Welsh. Now, we know that at this moment, Prince Charles on the royal train is actually watching. Now, it may be a frightening moment for you, and I expect it is, but I wonder if with just a few words of Welsh, you could, in fact, look at the camera and speak just for a moment in Welsh to the Prince of Wales. He'll understand, you'll understand, and I won't. Off you go. And now for the rest of the world who can't understand it, except the Prince of Wales and, and a few of you, what does that say? On behalf of the young children, a great welcome to you. And I think the Prince will get a very great welcome indeed. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. For this ceremony, the castle at Carnarvon has been, in the past year, transformed. Lord Snowden, constable of the castle, together with his colleague John Pound of the Ministry of Works and his friend Carl Toms, has been responsible for that transformation. Well, the sun is shining now on Miss Every, who's made her way back, and Mrs Monkhouse. The first time we've seen the sunshine all day. Well, it's nice to see it coming out now, at any rate. Well, now you're back in Carnarvon. How do you feel? Oh, I feel at home. And we have here right in Canada, but we have here right coming back here too. We want to stay here, really, once you come over here. I said right at the beginning of this programme, it's a rather dramatic setting. What do you think of it? Terrific. I wouldn't have missed it for anything, not for anything. And to feel that we've got a young prince here that we're going to... Uh, uh, the, his mother, then, I shall say that, going to invest him. Let's just get down to naturalness and say that his mother, which is a terrific thing today, that the Queen, his mother, is going to invest her own son. I think it's wonderful. You come from Planetly, but uh, can you speak Welsh still? Can I indeed? I, I, I'll tell you this. When he said that he could speak Welsh the other night, and he said he could, and when he said, I can say Llanelli, the group of us jumped up because I was <laughs> born in Lenefi. I'll get you to say something in Welsh at the end. How do you feel, Mrs Monkhouse, today coming back? Well, I feel wonderful. I felt as though I had come home when we got into Cardiff on Friday. But that was South Wales, and I am from North Wales. 
and I have not been in Carnarvon since I was a little girl and we camped here as girl guides. And it's just wonderful to be back in Carnarvon, see so many happy faces around and Real air all the pageant. Of and joyousness it is around just now. wonderful. It's wonderful to be here and to be part of it and it was worth all the 3,000 miles that we came to be here. <laughs> and you're going inside the castle. The last word's going to be with you in Welsh now. Yes. Come along. Tawasok Cymru, Bendith Diwarnoch, a pob gofal Miss Every and Mrs. Bankhouse, thank you very much indeed. Inside the castle, uh, there are some more people that you met on that film, and they're in there now, together with Richard Baker. Well, I tell you, you've come out here to find me surrounded by hundreds of school children who suddenly appear. Where have you all come from? Where have you come from? Uh, Ca Carnarvon. From Carnarvon. Who's come from anywhere but Carnarvon? Where have you come from? Once new is. Where? Bonsnewis. How far away is that? Two miles. Is it? Yeah. Two? That's a long way away, isn't it? <laughs> Which bits are you looking forward to? Come on, what are you looking forward to? When he comes out on the sun. When he is actually presented to the people, the yes. prince. Well, there you all are. You're, are you enjoying yourselves? Yes. yes. I wish I'd never said it. <laughs> Which of you can speak Welsh? Me. 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 Oh, well, that's a that's a great that's a great surprise. Which would be behind me so can speak Welsh? Me. Come on, you little yeah. face in there. Well, say something in Welsh. Um, you can't see him. He's by way. my right ear. Uh, what should you say? What should you say? Go on. Um, Come here, I can say that. Yeah. Can you say "Land fire, post queen, Greek, get him, weather drop with Randy, silly, or go, go, go"? I beat you. What? What about you? Where do you come from? Carnarvon. You come from Carnarvon? Yes. Are you very... Sorry, let, put, pull your face out here. Uh, I remember when I was a little boy at school on, on the Jubilee, they gave us all a mug at the time. I what have you got? Have you been given anything? A mug. mug. You've been given mugs yes. too. Uh, fine. Well, all these children have come here to see the investiture of the Prince of Wales. And the story of the Princes of Wales spans a thousand years and more of Welsh and English history. It's a story interlaced with fact and legend. Its origins lie in the confused history of the Welsh before Edward I ever came to Carnarvon. Today, Prince Charles becomes the 21st name in a long list of fascinating and infamous men who have held or laid claim to the title of Prince of Wales. The train now arriving at Carnarvon Station is the 810 out of London. This is one of the VIP trains that contains ministers and ambassadors. The prime minister contains presidents on board Hubert Humphrey, on board Tricia Nixon, Japanese ambassador, and some of these people we're going to try and talk with here on the station. So, so far, uh, some 5,000 people have arrived here at Carnarvon Station. The trains have been coming out. Two have come from London. This is the second three from Chester, three from Cardiff, and one from Crewe. And this is the last great occasion on which this station will be used because it's expected that Carnarvon station will be closed by the end of the year. Uh, we're now looking at uh, coach C, and uh, the people are beginning to come out. And on that, a Lord and Lady Butler. Uh, Norton Natchpool has just come out there of the train. Uh, Lord Aylston, we're waiting for, the chairman of the Independent Television Authority. Uh, just on my left, coming out now, uh, is Mr. Edward Heath. There's Mr. Heath, the leader of the opposition. Natural. And now the Prime Minister, Prime Minister and Mrs. Wilson just coming. Prime Minister's just going out of the front gate now towards his uh, car. He's one of the very few people who will, uh, in fact, be having a car. There's, there's Mr. Wilson. There's Mrs. Wilson to decide. They now have, uh, they now have about a mile and a half, a couple of miles to go. Meanwhile, on the station, we've got uh, other, other members of the, uh, of the government. Mr. Dennis Healy is, uh, is there. Uh, Mr. Healy there with Mrs. Healy. Michael Stewart, Mr. Peart, Michael Stewart at the back, Mr. Peart there. Lord Denning, Lord Denning just coming through now. A very important train indeed. There are some 380 VIPs on this train. 
and uh, we're going to try and uh, we're going to try and catch one or two of them as they go. We're just waiting for the ministerial cars to take the prime minister and some of the ministers down towards the castle. They'll travel down the route, and as this is the first time you've been back to Carnarvon, those shadows will be a very, very happy sight because the route is lined now with crowds that are sunlit. Uh, and for the very first time, the sun has been out fairly steadily. And uh, we're very, very pleased indeed to see it because earlier today, those of you who weren't with us earlier, we did have a shower or two. We certainly uh, did have the lowering grey clouds. But all of a sudden, uh, that, uh, that cleared. And now the Prime Minister coming down behind the outrider escort there is the Prime Minister's car, behind the Prime Minister's car, the other ministerial car. Now he's making his way down now towards the castle, right the way down Bridge Street. He'll then go around Carnarvon Square, around the square and into the castle. It's uh, quite, quite a short drive, in fact. And um, now I think that perhaps we can, uh, in fact, get one or two people. I, I, I see... Uh, his, His Excellency, the Ambassador from Japan. How do you do, sir? May I hear that your country are taking the television of this program live. Is there much interest <laughs> in your country? Uh, uh, we have always felt uh, a strong affinity with the United Kingdom and its people because uh, we have also all the monarchy. And... Uh, uh, Her Majesty the Queen and the royal family are very, very respected and popular among the Japanese. Do you have any uh, kind of set of manuals? Same, uh, same uh, uh, way as uh, His Majesty the Emperor and uh, Imperial family are. Do you have this kind of set of manual though in Japan? Yes, we you, have. Yes. You do? Oh, yes. Well, I think you're going to enjoy Carnarvon Castle today, sir. It's uh, a very beautiful setting, as you'll see when you go. Thank you very yes. much indeed, Your and, Excellency. Uh, uh, the, uh, over 90% uh, of the Japanese household uh, have television set. So uh, most, be... most of the uh, 100 million uh, Japanese uh, will be uh, 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 watching this program. 20 million sets, I'm told, you've well, got over there. <laughs> You're great and they'll be watching you. Thank you very much indeed, sir. And now I see in the back uh, the unmistakable figure of Sir Roden Cutler. How do you do, sir, from New South Wales, the governor of New South Wales. Uh, I must say, it's a bit, uh, you're, you're a bit high up for me, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're delighted to be here, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of interest in Australia on this. The Queen's not only Queen of Australia, but Prince Charles, of course, was at school there. And so today, I'm sure that they're looking at this on a direct broadcast over Telstar. They are indeed, sir. Taking a great deal of interest. Now, did you meet Prince Charles when he came to Timbertop? He stayed with us a couple of nights. Now, he said in a television interview with me, which we shared again today, with myself and Brian Connell, that that was the time he was really thrown to the lions. And he really implied that that was when he became a man, when he went to Australia. Did you have this sense? Well, I, I think that was a period when he was on his own and when he matured very much. There's no doubt about it now. He's a very mature uh, young man. When he came, he was a schoolboy, of course, and we were delighted to have him for those formative years. He really very much enjoyed it. He was saying to us that that was one part of his education that he really enjoyed being in Australia. Uh, how did the Australians react to him? Exceedingly well. Uh, they, um, they were thrilled and delighted that he chose to come to school in Australia. The Queen told me that it was the Prince's own idea. He was a little doubtful when he spoke to me about it. But, uh, we <laughs> Apprehensive, were... perhaps? Well, he said it wasn't necessarily his idea, but I'm sure that he enjoyed it, and we certainly enjoyed having him. Mr. Redden, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. I now see, I think, Miss Nixon. Thank you very much indeed, Sir Redden. Uh, I now see Miss Nixon, Miss Tricia Nixon, of whom we've, we've heard. Miss Nixon, hello, welcome hello. to Carnarvon. Thank you, it's so nice to be here. Now, we know that you have a certain interest in the royal family because when we saw the royal family film, yes. we saw your father going into. Have you seen the film? I saw it, yes, the first night I was here. 
What do you Excellent th film. What did you think about your father's remarks that you take a great deal of interest in the royal family? <laughs> well, it's true because when I was in college, I majored in modern European history and I've always had a great interest in the royal family. I should say that all our families are great Anglophiles. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you ever met Prince Charles, in fact, Mr. No, Nixon? I haven't, but I've met the Queen and Prince Philip in 1958 at the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway when I was just a little girl. And I remember that we had to wait a long time in the fog for the Britannia to be able to come through. And I was so afraid I wouldn't be able to meet the Queen and, and uh, her husband. And then I was so pleased when I did. And I wrote down everything she said. <laughs> well, we're very pleased, Mr. Nixon, to see that the sun, that the sun is shining there for yes, you. Yes, isn't is... it a beautiful day? Well, it couldn't be better. It started to drizzle here first yes. thing in the morning, but, but now oh, it's better. Are you going to have the opportunity of meeting Prince Charles or Princess Anne whilst you're here? Well, I think I will be meeting Princess Anne because Ambassador and Mrs. Annenberg are giving a dinner dance for me at Claridge's, and uh, Princess Anne will be there. So I'm looking forward Good. to that very much. Good. I hope you uh, enjoy the ceremony. I, sure you're I in for a I think a marvellous thrill when you actually see Carnarvon oh, Castle. Yes. I, I see Mr. Hubert Humphrey. Thank you very much indeed, Ms. Nixon. Fine. Right. Thank you. Goodbye. The Welsh Guards coming to take their share in lining the route in the square and down the castle ditch here. The Welsh Guards, who didn't exist when the last investiture took place, they weren't created until 1915, in fact last of the great guards regiments to be created. A very proud one. They'll also be providing the guard of honor at the water gate where the queen and the prince will arrive at the castle. of Marines and then the Naval Detachment, all Welshmen serving in numerous Royal Navy ships and they'll be lining the route just down here by the Watergate. Now let's uh, talk to one of his closest friends at Trinity, uh, Howell Jones, how, who's 21 today and come to see the 21st Prince installed. What about that for your friend? <laughs> Well, uh, it's a great occasion for me as well as for him, as you can say. D did, it, did he remember that you were 21 today? I was had too much to think about. Well, I don't know because I'm here and uh, I live in Cardiff, so I, I haven't been able to get in touch with my parents as yet. Now, you perhaps have talked to Prince Charles more than any other young man of his, of his generation. What manner of boy is he? Well, the, the thing that impressed me the most when I first met him and ever since is that he's... Um, well, normal, if you see what I mean. You, you don't expect yeah. him to be normal, and he is. Um, he's intelligent, hardworking, and gets on well with uh, all the people in Trinity. You have yourself very strong views about Wales, its relationship with England, and so on. This is something you must have discussed with him. Uh, how much did he understand your point of view and those of a great many Welshmen who feel like you? Well, um, before he went to Aberystwyth, I think he had a glimmering of... Uh, the feeling in Wales. I would discuss it with him quite often, you know, but um, until he'd gone to Aberystwyth, I don't think he could he could really understand Wales. You can't understand Wales until you've been here for some time and talked to people at length and tried to learn the language. And uh, I think he's he has understood a lot more since going there. Are you impressed by this uh, command of the Welsh language in such a short time? Well, literally, I'm amazed by it. Um, you know, he said he was going to learn it before he went, but. Uh, I didn't really believe that he'd learn the pronunciation as well as he has done because it's, it, as you know, it's very difficult for the English uh, tongue to sort of twist their ways around the ch's and the ch's, you know. But he seems to do this remarkably well, doesn't he? Well, it just amazes me. Can I ask you about him academically? Uh, is he good academically? Well, obviously, I wouldn't know um, his own essays and things, but he, his results seem to indicate that he's good and he worked very hard. and. Every impression I've had in talking with him in conversation has always been that he is good academically, yes. I can now confide in you that at this moment Prince Charles is watching you and hearing what you say. He's think, actually on the royal train. I thought, I thought <laughs> so you that's all right. Was, yeah. Well, that's all right. I thought I'd tell you halfway through how. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>
before we got any further. Yeah. So it's all right. So now from here on, you will no longer be embarrassed about what you say. And there is the orchestra performing Rhapsody for a Prince by Mansell Thomas with the choir Roy Bohanna conducting some of the soloists. Including Gwyneth Jones, Margaret Price, famous singers who are international operatic stars. Left, Margaret Price, Gwyneth Jones there. And on the right, Trevor Anthony and Geraint Evans on the extreme right hand side of the picture. He has a big solo to perform in one of the later pieces which we're hearing. One must add, though, that most of the boys and girls invited to take part in this procession did accept. And they accepted because people are beginning to know that the prince is concerned not to destroy, nor even to tolerate, but to build. They, they seem to sense that this investiture is a gesture of acknowledgement of the Welsh as a nation and not as we are sometimes sharply reminded it was in the days of Edward I, the harsh act of a conqueror. It would seem far cry, surely, to equate a ceremony in 1969 with one in 1301. In any case, 668 years is a long run for a grudge. David Goodridge from Pembrokeshire is, in fact, a bricklayer, followed by Lorraine Jones, the end from Landrin Wells Grammar School, on the left, and with her, the head boy of Pristine Grammar School. Now, they go into the Eagle Tower, and they will also be waiting for the Prince's procession. Now, in the front there, in the blue suit, Martin Woodruff, Cardiff High School, the swimmer, the silver medal Mexico Olympics for the butterfly stroke. Young people in plain clothes and also in uniform, in St. John's Ambulance uniform, in Queen's Scout uniform, because all these people play a very prominent part in youth organizations in their respective towns. Still, Rhapsody for a Prince by Mansell Thomas, being sung by the Investiture Choir, the BBC, played by the BBC Welsh Orchestra. Now, here are some of the peers and gentlemen who will later be taking part in the Prince's procession. You see, the two banners there, the banner of the Red Dragon and the banner of Llewellyn Ap Griffith, the last Welsh Prince of Wales. And follow some of the shops there. Pale grey, pink, white, pale grey again. Those who have colour, I hope you'll forgive me if I do detail some of the colours for those who haven't got it. Another grey, um, mostly grey and white on that side. If we come round a little bit further, we shall see a rather startling red bank. There we are. A dark red with white windows. Smartened up the square very considerably. The square's been repaved and improved. Densely packed with people today. Who said there were a lot of seats to spare? The square's been repaved and 
Lots of other roads have been improved. One of the many benefits will remain to the town after the investiture is over. And of course, there's the post office, an Arvon post office. The council's also had to uh, do quite a lot of other more mundane things, provide parking space for 40,000 cars and some 300 toilets for all the people coming in. We look back now at the procession of the councillors. This includes two insurance men, a blacksmith, a marine engineer, two shopkeepers, six teachers. There seem to be a very great number of teachers in North Wales. A retired sea captain, bank manager, and a housewife. Carnarvon, in fact, is a very Welsh town. It has the highest Welsh-speaking population of any town in the country. And indeed, they have their own dialect, which isn't understood by anybody outside the town at all. There's the Royal Train. We go two and a half miles now north of Carnarvon. The Royal Train approaching through the woods. The special platform which has been built at uh, Griffiths Crossing to receive it. This is almost the spot where the previous Prince of Wales began his entry into Carnarvon. There's the special platform. Lord Lieutenant, there's the High Sheriff of Carnarvonshire, Evan Wynne-Jones, Secretary of State for Wales, George Thomas, and the Lord Lieutenant of Carnarvonshire will also be going on board the train, Sir Michael Duff. The train going very slowly because it's not, in fact, due to pull up until two o'clock. Um, it's obviously trying to be absolutely on time. And as those of you who saw the royal film the other weekend will remember, there's a tremendous amount of preparation that goes on inside the royal train for an occasion like this, and you'll probably be able to imagine some of these preparations. There are the Household Cavalry, horses of the Household Cavalry, who will provide two escorts today, a Prince of Wales escort for the Prince of Wales, and then a Sovereign's escort for the Queen herself drawn up, waiting for the arrival of the Prince and the Queen. There's the guard of honour of the... Of the <laughs> not quite the right way to put it, was it? There's the goat of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers who are providing the Guard of Honour here. Um, this fine regiment, the North Wales equivalent of the Royal Regiment of Wales in the south, and in fact, the senior regiment in Wales. Very many interesting points about the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. There in the background, they have the Household Cavalry. One of the most interesting features of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers is that they have a group of pioneers, ceremonial pioneers, and here they are. These are the men who are supposed to do the really tough work of the battalion, dressed in their aprons. And in the background, there's Sergeant Street, who's their sergeant, who wears a red sash, and he's got a beard. He's the only man who's allowed to wear a beard officially on a ceremonial parade in the British Army. The Royal Train has in fact, now it can be told, spent the night at Menai Bridge, not very far away from here, and the Royal Family this morning, as you may have heard, have been watching television. In the background, the Ferodo brake lining factory, which was opened a little while ago by Princess Margaret.
Michael Duff on the left, the Lord Lieutenant of Carnarvonshire, Evan Wynne Jones, the Sheriff, and George Thomas, the Secretary of State for Wales. They'll go on board briefly to greet the royal family. We shan't, in fact, see any members of the royal family for certainly for a good five minutes, perhaps almost ten, so we could go back perhaps and look at what's going on in the castle. <laughs> Prime Minister and Mrs. Wilson wearing a pale mauve dress and a matching hat with some blue in. Rather striking outfit. They are followed by the Lord Chancellor, Lord Gardner. Griffiths Crossing, members of the royal family coming out, Duchess of Gloucester, Prince Richard of Gloucester, out into the cars which will bring them to the castle. There's the Duke of Kent, very smart uniform. Ours, the Duchess of Kent in a brilliant ice cream pink dress. Angus Ogilvy and Princess Alexandra. Princess Alexandra wearing a bright mustard yellow outfit. Mountbatten, personal ADC to the Queen. So the members of the royal family leave Griffith's Crossing on their way into Carnarvon now. And another brief glimpse of the Prime Minister, and Mrs. Wilson and the Lord Chancellor being conducted to their places in the upper ward. And now a very important procession is coming down. The procession of the church in Wales it consists of representatives of all the Christian bodies, non-conformist churches, Anglican church, Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Bishop of Menevia, the Archbishop of Cardiff, the Bishop of Bangor, the Archbishop of the Church in Wales are there just behind the Bible, the leader of the Free Churches in Wales, Reverend William Owen, and the Bible is carried there. The Bible which is so significant in the preservation of the Welsh language, the Welsh Bible of 1588. Born by Margaret Parry from the Girls' Grammar School in Carnarvon. The cross in front of her, carried by Kenna Jones, a sixth former from Carnarvon Grammar School, a special cross made of slate and specially designed by Lord Snowden. Now, what we're looking at now is uh, an incident of some yeah, kind out in a field near Sportsman Nursery. Somebody's been hurt there. Somebody's 
I heard an explosion just a little moment ago. We thought that one of the guns had gone off accidentally. There could just possibly have been an explosion. Tremendous security precautions are being taken all around the town. Hundreds of police and detectives around, so let's hope this is not something serious. Ups, old people, children, a quarter of a million. And there's By the Prince of Wales. over it. Just to interrupt for a moment, Emlyn, there's the Prince of Wales. He's got out of the train now and into his carriage, wearing the uniform of the Colonel-in-Chief of the Royal Welsh Regiment. Smiling. With him is the Secretary of State for Wales. Wearing the Order of the Garter and his only medal, as he himself has said, the Coronation Medal. David Chekits is a query in the foreground. And there's the escort commander, Major Broughton, of the Blues and Royals, who will, his horse, and the semi-state Landor, will bring the prince now into town. First time we've seen the prince in a state drive on his own, and the first time that a Prince of Wales escort has been seen for a good many years. Since, in fact, his great uncle was Prince of Wales. He moves off into town. We shall pick him up in just a few minutes when he's entering the outskirts of Carnarvon itself. And there's the Guard of Honour, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, and the Household Cavalry disappearing at the top there into the distance. And there, out at Griffith's Crossing, Majesty the Queen in a brilliant yellow coat and matching hat with the Duke of Edinburgh in Field Marshal's uniform. mother behind the queen is wearing apple green and apple green lace dress and then princess anne is in turquoise blue with a matching pillbox hat the queen will now be invited to inspect the guard of honor of the royal welsh fusiliers Now, here's the prince's escort coming into the outskirts of the town, just to the northwest of the town. I should think now about three quarters of a mile away from the castle. Prince of Wales escort, one officer and 40 men from the lifeguards and the Blues and Royals. It's a Blues and Royals escort, and so the Blues and Royals come after the carriage, which in this case is drawn by four bay horses from the Royal Mews. Now 
we should be ready at any moment when the other members of the royal family have got into their carriages for this procession to move off, the Queen's procession, and for the royal salute. This, of course, is a moment which has been looked forward to by vast numbers of people in Canada. But a moment also of great tension. There's the stud groom. He has the job of timing the procession and uh, he's acting as a pace setter. And then horses of the Metropolitan Police. Very experienced in such things. Among the Royal Regiment of Wales on display today, there are, in fact, a group of Australians uh, who come from New South Wales. They're members of the Volunteer Army. We've been looking around to them. We haven't quite spotted them yet. But there are five of them. And they come from the Regiment Connected, the New South Wales Regiment of Australia's 2nd Division, affiliated to the Royal Regiment of Wales. This is the narrowest part of the street coming into the square. In front of the escort just coming up to the men's outfitting shop called Percy Geo. He's a cousin of the mayor. In fact, uh, lots of people around here seem to be related. So the procession approaches the town square and there's an awkward turn for the escort. Welsh guards lining the route here. Here in the square, people slept out all night to wait for this moment.
First of the lifeguards now enter Castle Ditch, the narrow street just down by the side of the castle. And there's really heartwarming enthusiasm. there, just a few boos among the chairs. The Guard of Honour of the Welsh Guards waiting in the foreground. When the prince reaches the water gate, his standard will be broken out on the Eagle Tower. At the moment, flying on the Eagle Tower, there are the Union Jack and the Standard of Wales. Now here's the Queen, following up behind her son and just on the outskirts of the town with a full sovereign's escort of household cavalry. 109 men from the lifeguards and the Blues and Royals. Greeted by the Mayor of Carnarvon, Deputy Constable of the Castle, and the Town Clerk of Carnarvon. It's the Constable of the Castle and the Minister of Public Building and Works, Mr. Silky, who is, of course, responsible for the maintenance of these ancient fabrics. Prince's personal standard for use in Wales. After the Archdruid and the President of the National Estate Foot Court, Secretary of the Society of Camaradoli, and Sir Thomas Parry Williams.
she looks nice. Now, when the Queen reaches the water gate of the castle, there will be a ceremony, a very ancient ceremony of admission, which will take place as soon as the Queen arrives. She'll be received at the foot of the steps of the castle by the Mayor of Carnarvon as Deputy Constable. The query in waiting will then knock on the door and demand admission in the name of the Queen. Then the constable of the castle, Lord Snowden, will descend the steps bearing the key, which is the token of his right to maintain the security of the castle. It's a huge affair, made of steel, 15 inches long, weighing six and a quarter pounds. And when the queen gets to the water gate, gets out of her carriage, she will touch the key and return it into the constable's keeping. I told you about this a little in advance so that when it happens, we can just watch it. There'll be a royal salute from the Guard of Honour. And when the Queen gets into the inside of the castle, the royal standard will replace the prince's standard on equal time. Now begins the ceremony of the investiture. A ceremony which is exactly as it was in medieval times. It has not changed. Her Majesty the Queen commands the Earl Marshal to direct Garter King of Arms to summon His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Sir Anthony then proceeds to the chamber and tower to convey to the prince Her Majesty's command.
prince's procession is headed by the Wales Herald of Arms on the right and the Chester Herald of Arms on the left. After the heralds, a man whose office was created only five years ago, the Secretary of State for Wales. He will read the letters patent in Welsh. Garter, King of Arms, bearing the letters patent. These may be only paper, but they are all important, vital, for they constitute the instrument which will create Prince Charles, Prince of Wales. Prince himself, bareheaded now in readiness for his crown, is flanked by Lord Davies and Lord Dinner. The sword is carried by Earl Lloyd George of Duivor. The crown by the President of the Liberal Party of Wales, Lord Ogmore. The Golden Rod, a Wialen Ayr by Lord Haycock. The Ring by Lord Maylor. The Mantle by the former British Ambassador to Washington, Lord Harlech. Garter, King of Arms, delivers the letters patent to the Lord Chamberlain. Presents them to the Queen. Her Majesty hands the English text of the letters patent to the Home Secretary, the Light Honourable James Callaghan, and the Welsh text to the Secretary of State for Wales, the Right Honourable George Thomas. The Home Secretary will now read the letters patent in English. Elizabeth II, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of our other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith, to all lords, spiritual and temporal, and all other our subjects whatsoever, to whom these presents shall come, greeting. Know ye that we have made and created, and by these our letters do make and create our most dear son, Charles, Philip, Arthur, George, Prince of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, Duke of Cornwall and Rothsay, Earl of Carrick, Baron of Renfrew, Lord of the Isles and Great Steward of Scotland, Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester, and to the same, our most dear son, Charles Philip Arthur George, have given and granted, and by this our present charter do give, grant and confirm, the name, style, title, dignity and honor of the same principality and earldom. And him, our most dear son, Charles Philip Arthur George, as has been accustomed, we do ennoble and invest with the said principality and earldom by girting him with a sword, by putting a coronet on his head and a gold ring on his finger, and also by delivering a gold rod into his hand that he may preside there and may direct and defend those parts. To hold to him and his heirs, kings of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of our other realms and territories, heads of the Commonwealth forever. Wherefore, we will and strictly command for us 
are heirs and successors that our most dear son, Charles Philip Arthur George, may have the name, style, title, state, dignity and honour of the Principality of Wales and Earldom of Chester aforesaid, unto him and his heirs, kings of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of our other realms and territories, heads of the Commonwealth, as is above mentioned, in witness whereof, we have caused these our letters to be made patent. Witness ourself at Westminster, the 26th day of July, in the seventh year of our reign. Next, the Secretary of State for Wales will read the same letters patent in Welsh, during which the Queen will invest the Prince of Wales with the insignia of his Principality and of the Earldom of Chester. Elizabeth Ryle, Droy Ras Tiw, Brenhinas Adernas Cavino, Pradain Vaur Agogledd Iwerddon, and Ternasoi, and Triogaithai Eraish, Penaith the Gamanulad, Akam the Fanid Afid, Kavarchion, Ir Argloidi, Aspradol Adayarol Bobin, Akir Os Undailiaid Eraish, Adichon Derbin, Ageriai Hin. Vaded haspis ichwi, darvod ini unaid a chrei, a throi ein schlather hun, a radim an gunaid a chrei, ein han wilab vab, Charles, Philip, Arthur, George, tawasog a dairnas gavinol, pradain vaur, a gogled iwerddon, dig kernew, a rothese, yars karek, barun renfru, argloid aranasoid, a frif steward aralban, and de wasog camri, a yars kair, a kido anto. Ein Han Wilab Vab, Charles, Philip, Arthur, George, Er Hothoid, Aka Kavloinoid, Athroi Ein Charter Bressanol, Er Hothun, A Kavloinun, Aka Kadarnhaun, Eno, Kaveno, Taito, Irdas Akan Radev, A Dawasogait Hono, Ar Yarshait Hono Akvela bin Arve Arwiskun Akan Radezun Ein Han Wilab Vat Charles Philip Arthur George Ar Dawasogait Hono Ar Yarshait Hono Troy Ai Uregesi Ev Achledev Her Majesty, following the age-old tradition, takes the sword and creates her son, Earl of Chester. The symbol of sovereignty. Modroi air arai vis. The gold ring, symbol of unity, the unity in this instance being the prince's marriage to Wales. A heavy droidros gloido guialenaur iulau.
the gold rod, symbol of temporal rule. I cadro is a wave, I at a vezion. When he knows the Dernas Cavino, Pradine Vaur, a goblet of the prince pays homage to the queen by placing his hands between those of a mother. A Gamanulad, the Ross Pith, a Mahani, a Revicious Shul, a Karhodun or Hamin Kai. Arain ran ni an hete vedion an holan wind. A bead in han we love vab Charles, Philip, Arthur, George, Gail Inu, Kavenu, Taito, Astad, Irdas ak an radeth. Tawaso gaith kamri ak yar shaith kair. A enwid ichod arnoi hin a yetevedion. Save bren hinnoid a dernas gavinol, pradain vaur a gogle di werdon, an ternasoi, an triogaithai erais, penaithiai a gamanuat vela kraboisloid ichod. And does the olaith ohane? Radim wedi peri ir slathir hun gael ai wneud yn fraintiol. Nan i ein hynain a dim yn tystio yn San Stephen ar a chweched dydd ar hygain o orffena yn saithfed flwyddyn ein teinasiad. Troi waran Dan Lovnod, Avren Hines, Aihin. I. Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. And faith and truth I will bear unto thee to live and die against all manner of folks. The Queen, by raising up the Prince and exchanging with him the kiss of fealty, fealty being the ancient word for loyalty, the Queen pledges herself to protect this her dependent and acknowledges his status as a sovereign prince. Meanwhile, the Home Secretary and the Secretary for Wales deliver the letters patent to the Queen, who hands them to the Prince. The loyal address from the people of Wales will be read to the Prince by the President of the University College of Wales, Aberystwyth. Trigain Mlynedd Namin Dwy o Blynyddoedd the Nôl yma yn y bangre hon yng Nghastell Carnarfon estynodd Sir John Rhys groeso Cymru gyfan i rhag flaenydd eich ichelder brenhinol. A canta in Shank Ivank Ar Adeg Ayar Wisco and the Wasog Camry. A Hedu Ar Chlesir Kefilib, the Maestin Croiso, a Reen Morganes Ich with I, the Wasog Arash. A Radeg Hono Urthatkan Ay Walchter, Voder Ar Wiscon Digwith Ar Deer Camry, Ve Eglirod Sir John. Y cysylltiad agos a fi'r hwng a'i lodau'r teulu brenhinol a Chymru o ran gwehelith a chyfraniad i'w bywyd. Heddiw, da yw'r dystiolaeth hon 
Amai Barhad. Naya Modai Bowid Kamle Thassol Widin Ewid Tower Er Dechrer Ganri Hon. A Thaimloth Kamri Vel Pub Glad, Luister I Grim. On the Naur Mount Dadi I Guahanol, my Kamri and Edrich Mline at Governor. Pan with Tawasog Kamri and Amlidorin Bersonol, Vui Vui and I Problemai, I Dehe Adai, A Hais I Thradod Yadai, A Hes I Fobble. A Kurthir Tawasogam Serhiandi, my Kamri in Haderi, a be the Kasestiad Brenhinol Hun, and Vodioni Gadarn Hai a Boid, I Gaboy Thogi I Havraniad Ir Dernas Gavinol. A gloiwi a delwedd yng ngolwg y gymanwlad a gwledu the byd. Yn yr hyder a'r gwbaith hwn, ac ar yr achlysu'r hanesyddol hwn, dymi nhw'n felly eich cyfarch a croesawu a thystio un tair ngarwch. May it please your majesty. Fifty-eight years ago, in this ancient stronghold of Carnarvon, Sir John Rees extended the welcome of the whole of Wales to your Royal Highness's predecessor and expressed his delight that the investiture was being held on Welsh soil. He gave the historical background to the close connections that have existed between the royal family and Wales connections both of ancestry and of service to the life of our country. Today, in the same famous place, we are met to extend the same warm welcome to your Royal Highness. Social conditions have changed a great deal since the beginning of this century, and Wales, like every other country, has felt the force of change. Now the Principality looks forward to a period when its prince will associate himself personally with its aspirations and problems, its language and traditions, and the welfare of its people. And as your Royal Highness reveals your affectionate interest, Wales hopes that this royal connection will serve to strengthen its own life, to enrich its contribution to the United Kingdom, and to enhance its image in the eyes of the Commonwealth and the countries of the world. It is with this confidence and hope that we greet you and declare our loyalty. Sir Ben Bryn Thomas. Mae eich ynechiad wedi fy nghyffwrth yn ddwys, a gallaf eich sicrhau fy mod wedi cymryd sylwi o'r gobeithion am lygywyd yn ddyn nhw. Yn wir, rhywun bwriadu cysylltu fy hun o ddifri, mae o'n gair a gweithred a chymaint o fywyd y dywysogaeth, a'r fath dywysogaeth ydy hi a gafydd yn bosibl. Roedd yn un teimlo cryn dipyn o ffawchter ac i mosiwn wrth dderbyn y symbolau hyn om zwydd yn y gair odidog hon. Lle ni allai neu beidio a theimlo priw gofro yn awyrgylch i gwychter hynafol. Neu fedrwn i ne, chwaith, lai na bod yn ymwybodol o hennis maeth Cymru a'i ffyndafyniad i barhau ar wahan ac i wachod i threftadaeth arbennig y hun. Threftadaeth sy'n mynd yn ôl i niwloedd hen hennis y brithon ac sydd wedi cynherchu 
cymaint o ddewrion, tywysogion, beir, ysgol heigion, ac yn ddiweddarach fydd gan torion enwog. Gwn cofiadu i iawn, a ser amlwg y myd y ffilmiau. Fe ysbrydolwyd bob un o'r bobl hyn. Mae yw'n rhyw ffordd neu gilydd gan y trefthedaeth hon. The words of your address have certainly touched me deeply, and I can assure you I have taken note of the hopes expressed in them. It is indeed my firm intention to associate myself in word and deed with as much of the life of the Principality as possible. And what a Principality! It is with a certain sense of pride and emotion that I have received these symbols of office. Here in this magnificent fortress, where no one could fail to be stirred by its atmosphere of time-worn grandeur, nor where I myself could be unaware of the long history of Wales in its determination to remain individual and to guard its own particular heritage. A heritage that dates back into the mists of ancient British history, that has produced many brave men, princes, poets, bards, scholars, and more recently, great singers, a very memorable goon, and eminent film stars. All these people have been inspired in some way by this heritage. I hope and trust that in time, I shall be able to offer my own contribution. And to do that, I seek your cooperation and understanding. Speaking for myself, as a result of my two months stay in this country, I have come to see far more in the title I hold than hitherto. I am more than grateful to the people of this principality for making my brief stay so immensely worthwhile and for giving me such encouragement in the learning of the language. I know that social conditions have changed since 50 years ago and, of course, are still changing. The demands on a Prince of Wales have altered. But I am determined to serve and to try as best I can to live up to those demands, whatever they might be in the rather uncertain future. One thing I am clear about, and it is that Wales needs to look forward without forsaking the traditions and essential aspects of her past. The past can be just as much a stimulus to the future as anything else. By the affirmation of your loyalty today, for which I express my gratitude, this will not simply be a faint hope. This moment is based on the legend 
that Edward I showed his infant son to the people of Wales at this spot. And it was here that the prince's great uncle was shown to the people in 1911. Yes, sir. A great shout goes up to the children. You've probably spotted the prince coming down the steps to this specially constructed platform. In front of him, you will see the statue of Lloyd George, the town square with its vast crowds, and beyond the square, the mountains of Snowdon. Taking spontaneous applause, and this is the real thing. And uh, well, I make no bones about it. Uh, me, a man Gefreus Drosben, I find it very moving. His youth and his modest bearing, it's a good combination. Now, here comes the fly past. Twelve phantom aircraft, four lightnings. Just a glimpse of the fly past. Rather low cloud here today. Another quick shot of them as they go away. That's 800 feet. Aircraft from Royal Air Force squadrons in strike and air support commands in close formation. And now it's time for the departure of the Queen and the Prince of Wales to leave Carnarvon Castle. Carriages will be brought up. will be lowered on the Eagle Tower and all those present in the castle will signal the end of this rare and splendid ceremony. the royal family all together the younger children didn't come today perhaps it was rather a long ceremony for them pause while the other members of the royal family get into their carriages. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, Princess okay. Margaret, in the carriage behind.
Queen Mother, Princess Anne, and the Master of the Horse, the Duke of Beaufort, in that carriage. And now, the Prince is coming up to the town square of Carnarvon. smiling reception for the prince who responds in the same way in the town square of Canal. So the prince goes off now back to join the royal train and then later he'll embark on his progress through Wales, culminating with the award to him of the freedom of the capital city, Cardiff. And as they go, Perhaps I may be allowed a word on behalf of all the non-Welsh people who've witnessed this ceremony today, both in Carnarvon itself and throughout the world. Our thanks to Wales, this most hospitable of countries. Mein blesser mawr, imi vodamach.